You know, I'm sitting, I'm looking at Arn, but I'm looking at Tim, I'm looking at Lisa, and I've looked out there and seen a lot of other people. I know a lot of you, and that's what happens when you're in your 60s and you've been doing this your entire <laughs> life, and, uh, and, and from all over the world, and I've met you before as well. Um, uh, I'm sitting here, uh, Tim, the former executive director of the National Association of Interpretation, probably my oldest colleague in this room, going back to when we were, uh, I don't know, contemplating whether to have tattoos and things like that. I was hippie, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and there's some s sort of symmetry here. And then Margo, where are you? And there's uh, Margo Carla, who's, who's the new executive director of the National Association for Interpretation. So sort of a new era. Um, but listen, it's really gratifying to be here. Uh, Eva, thank you. Pear, Anders, Christina Svensson, who's in Sigtuna, preparing for many of us to arrive tomorrow uh, to a very well-planned conference. Um, and to Celia, who's no longer here, but to the University of Agricultural Sciences, who's uh, made it possible for me to be here uh, twice a year for a month each time, just to work on uh, developing a strength in interpretive research here at the Agricultural Sciences University, which is by any measure one of the strongest programs in environmental communication in all of Europe. And so it's really a, p a pleasure and an honor to be asked to be here. Uh, I think I should admit the fellowship is the August T. Larson visiting professor something-ish that, that I'm here, which is very generously funding my work. Um, now, Eva asked me to talk about <laughs> interpretation. Isn't that what you do? I mean, she, Eva asked me to talk about interpretation as strategic communication, which she knows, and uh, many of you in this room know, has been sort of my thing. Uh, I've, um, I've thought for a long time, coming from a background in, in, in the psychology of communication, that interpreters can be more purposeful, more strategic in how they approach their work. And um, I guess that's why I want to talk about the end game of interpretation because if you're going to know how to do your work on purpose, you need to know what it looks like at the end, don't you? you know? And so that's the, the, what I want to talk with you about today. Uh, uh, for many of you, I would guess that word end game is new. Uh, it, it really comes from chess. How many of you play chess? So, so it, 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 it is, it, it, to, a, to a master chess player, this idea of the end game is what happens in a chess match when two players look at the remaining pieces still on the board and they both know at that point who the winner is and who the loser is and neither one of them can do anything about it. It's the end game. And you might have seen two master players get up and leave the board and still full of pieces. It's because, because of their knowledge they realized they had reached the end game. In common usage the word end game means sort of the, the status or the condition of things. How things look at the end of some successful, some successful pro process. And so when I talk about the end game of interpretation, I'm talking about that. I'm talking about how things look if you've done a good job. And how would you know? And so, oh, I need to, sorry, I need to, to do this. I'm not very good at standing behind things. I'm better at walking around. So, uh, there we go. So, it's a question. It's a question that I have spent my entire professional life trying to find some answers to. I know it's a sorry existence, but somebody had to do it. <laughs> and, 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 and the question is, how would you know at the end of a day of being an interpreter or presenting some interpretive product or device, how would you know if you did a good job? Well, in order to answer that question, you need to know what you're trying to achieve. No, you need to know what the end looks like. And, and, and I've listed a couple of words at the bottom here. These are the kinds of words that you hear from interpreters all across the world. I've worked in almost 50 countries, and every time we have a discussion about why we are in our business, words like this get used. Well, we want other people to care about nature, don't we? We want people to appreciate their environment, or to appreciate their cultural heritage. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus my remarks this morning on what research has told us about how to get to the end game that looks like people caring and people appreciating. What are the pathways and what are the mechanisms that lead, that lead according to the 
empirical research record that can lead to things like caring and appreciation. And we'll talk a little bit about what we do know, and we'll talk a little bit about what we think we know, but don't. So let, me, let me come back to that. Uh, in, um, in the published research literature, you're going to forgive the baseball metaphor. Baseball is still the center of my life. I played one year professionally, right? And, I, and it's a big deal. There's a, there's a, we have a family brick in one of the major league baseball stadiums in the United States. So that, I'm sure they built the whole stadium just around my brick, right? <laughs> right. That, and this is the famous player who once said something very funny. When you come to a fork in the road, take it. Well, there is a fork in the road for interpreters because the end games I'm going to present to you are choices. They are truly choices because where they take us on the path to professionalism or on the path to excellence in interpretation. Excellence meaning people caring and people appreciating. They take us in very different directions. And I'll give you some examples of those. The three models of the three end games that you see most in the published literature, and here I'm going back to the 1960s, so now a half a century of accumulated research findings. So there are some patterns. Are the didactic, or you can think of it as the teacher end game, the infotainment or entertainment, entertainer end game, and the, the, what I call the meaning making end game, and others as well will call it this, or the provoker. The end game that Tilden, Peter Tilden, talked a lot about in his book. So let's start with the um, didactic end game. Underlying each of these end games is a major assumption that is made. And that's the part you see in quotation marks and italics below the, the title. In this end, end game, we assume that if we can just give our audiences enough information about the things we interpret, that eventually they will care. So if they know what we know, eventually they will care like we care. Okay. Now I don't want to throw water <laughs> on a party, <laughs> but I can't tell you how false this assumption is. It has never been supported by research. We all know that knowledge is good, but that's not what this end game says. This knowledge says that when your audience has your knowledge, what's in between your ears, then they will, the world will be better. They will care and they will appreciate. And you know what? Studies just do not support that. In fact, it's called the learning leads to loving hypothesis. It's been tested directly a few times and it's every time gone down in a big ball of fire. And it's been tested indirectly probably thousands of times, every time we try to correlate some knowledge measure with some attitudinal measure, it doesn't hold up. In fact, sometimes they're even negatively correlated. <laughs> you can know a lot and care a little. And you can know very little and care a lot. Which sometimes I think is sort of what our audiences might be. How much you know has little to do with how much you care. In fact, forgetting is normal and predictable. We too forget. You're going to forget if, if, if an hour later I ask you, I give you a test over what I talked about today, you would all do, yeah. But if, but, but if I came back and talked to you tomorrow or the next day, yeah. And, 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 and if that test of your recall of my facts is my measure of performance, if it tells me how well or poorly I did, I will fail. I know right now I'm failing. Because you're, so you see, this end game not only doesn't correlate with caring and appreciation, it also sets us up for failure. Because the best we can achieve over time is mediocrity and probably failure. Unless the facts that I ask you to recall are your own facts. Then your recall will be very high, but not necessarily my facts. All right, we'll come back to this later. Here's the question then. <laughs> Once all that forgetting happens, and once those facts are gone, is there any reason to believe that something might remain? You know, some dust or some residue that might look like some kind of difference. So let's go to the next end game, which is the infotainment or entertainer end game. In this end game, the, the major underlying assumption is different. This is all about attention holding. That's what entertainment literally means, inter, inter entretener, old French, also Spanish, to hold strongly in the mind of another. 
It says if you hold somebody's attention long enough, something's good got to happen, don't you think, Arn? If we can just keep them entertained, right, and keep their eyes on us and keep their ears on us, then something good will happen. That's as far as the assumption goes. And so a lot of interpreters spend much time on entertainment. Bells, whistles, innovative media, clever linkages, and, and that sort of thing. Sort of a, you don't have Ripley's Believe It or Not here. Uh, it's a Guinness World Record Book approach. Well, we know that three-fourths of successful interpretation is in fact entertainment. Now I say that because if you look at, at a broad, and here I'm talking about about a century's worth of research on how communication can influence human beings. Some of you have heard these letters, T-O-R and E, thematic, organized, relevant, and enjoyable. Well, the theme, we'll all, we all know what that is. I'll come to it in a minute again. But the O, the R, and the E are entertainment. The entertainment industry is an O-R-E industry. If you make something easy to follow, that's the O. You make it matter to the audience, that's the R. And you make it enjoyable, that's the E. They will pay attention to it until the cows come home. That's entertainment. The question is, is it entertainment for entertainment's sake, as an end in itself, as a stand-up comic or a musician? Or are you entertaining for a reason? And that's where the T has a strategic purpose, holding attention in order to communicate a compelling idea, which is what the T is. So we'll come back to this. And by the way, in case you're wondering, these are my friends uh, Eloise and Arthur. They're at a historic town in, in uh, Victoria, Australia called Sovereign Hill, which interprets the 1850s gold rush and the importance of the gold rush and really in creating Australia's uh, national identity, its flag and independence and so forth. And yes, they are looking at a pile of horse manure. And I don't know, it, it, the only reason I show this picture, Arne, is because they look very entertained by it. <laughs> so that's the entertainment endgame. Okay, now let's go to the final, oh, Holding an audience's attention, according to no research, guarantees that you will accomplish anything else okay. in and of itself. Okay, the final end game. <laughs> I thought I could have to answer this question one more time. Once all the fun and the entertainment have subsided, is there any reason to suspect that something could remain? Some dust or residue that would look like a difference having been made. And the answer is yes. And that yes becomes apparent when you consider the final end game that I want to present to you. This is what I call the meaning making or provocation end game. Those words will sound familiar to you if you've at all uh, been acquainted with uh, Freeman Tilden's work and interpreting our heritage. This end game says, you know, if we can keep people entertained long enough, <laughs> and if we can, if we can um, give them um, information that matters to them, they can make connections that are their own. They construct their own connections. It's called constructivism. How many of you have heard of constructivist learning, right? This is where this term comes from. I can't pound knowledge into your head. All I can do is facilitate a process wherein you do your own thinking and create your own subjective knowledge of the world. So when Tilden said, through understanding, appreciation, he meant your own subjective understanding, which could be wrong, couldn't it? Right? But nevertheless, the only caring that you can do, that any of us is capable of doing, must come from the thoughts that we ourselves think between our own two ears. And without that, caring is not possible. So, if we can get other people to make their own connections, caring can result. It doesn't say it will result. Human beings are far more complex than that, fortunately. But it can. This is what studies do support. Now we're talking about many dozens, even in the hundreds of studies, have shown so much so that it's no longer a hypothesis. It is a postulate. It's a given basic assumption that if you want to influence somebody's attitude about something, and appreciation is a generally positive attitude about some object or thing or place or whatever it is that you're interpreting, then 
the thing you must do is make them think their own thoughts because from those thoughts can come the caring and appreciation that you want to create. Does that make sense? Studies strongly support this. You know what's interesting though? Is that if you ask a psychologist like me, how does human operating memory look? I mean, if I could, I'm not going to do this Eva, but if I could open up your head and look inside there, that's what I would see. I would see thoughts. I would see meanings and connections that you've made, inferences, lessons learned. I would see all the morals of all the stories you ever read. Some of them would be right and some of them might be wrong, but nevertheless they are your subjective understanding. I call these themes, they're as much themes as the interpreter's theme, except that one interpreter's single well-developed theme, if it provokes thought, can create many themes inside the person's head. I call these personal themes, plural, personal themes. I also call them sentences in the head <laughs> because they are, everybody knows that a theme is a sentence, right? This is the prevailing view, not just of how interpretation works, it is the prevailing view of how communication can influence human beings to care about something, to appreciate it strongly enough that they care about it. When given the opportunity, they will act in defense of it. They might even fight for it. Those of you who are involved in adversarial natural resource and environmental issues, you understand that your motivation to fight and defend a point of view comes from this type of caring, doesn't it? Not from your knowledge, because the person sitting across the table from you might know just as much about the science of it. Isn't that correct? Okay. Well, this is not a new idea. Freeman Tilden said it in 1957. He was 30 years ahead of any research or even theory to suggest that this is the way we ought to see communication. When I was taking interpretive meth in my first course, Tim, and we had to memorize this, and that's all it was, just words that I memorized. It wasn't until 30 years later through the process of, 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 of being immersed in this growing research record, and much of this research didn't even start until 1975, and didn't really amass into a body of consistent findings until the 1980s. And yet he said it in 1957. He was a smart guy. It's, we're not trying to teach anything to anybody. We're trying to blow them away. We're trying to provoke them to such profound thought that they lose themselves in a sea of their own thoughts. They might even quit listening to you because the first thing you said might have impacted them so thoroughly that all they want to do was think about it and maybe tell the person standing next to them what's thought provoking is talk provoking. That's what Tilden was trying to say to us. He wasn't saying to the interpreter, you reveal the meanings, even though his definition says interpretation is an educational activity which aims to reveal meanings and relationships. If you read the rest of his book, you see he couldn't have meant, that's what you do. What he meant was that if you do your job well, you will provoke visitors to discover what he called their own truths, their subjective meanings. Remember the, the ears with themes between... In common day vernacular, that's the way I would say it. And I would say it maybe something like this. The main thing interpretation should do is provoke people to make their own themes inside of their own heads. And so our role is not teacher or revealer. Our job is facilitator. We are provokers of thought. And if we, at the end of the day, want to know if we've done a good job, we'd be concerned not whether people can answer 10 factual questions correctly. Those are my questions, my knowledge, aren't they? Not simply did they pay attention long enough, as the entertainment game, end game suggests, but I would want to know, are they thinking thoughts? How many thoughts are they thinking? A lot or just a few? And what are they thinking about? Are they thinking about things that connected to what I interpreted, or are they thinking about something altogether different? The Swedish Center for Nature Interpretation has conducted the first, it's called thought listing, this methodology. It's very well established in psychology. It's been used for a long time. And then the Center for Nature Interpretation is now conducting the first thought listing exercises in, in, in are they just Naturum or another? 
in the natura in, 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 their, in their specially branded uh, nature centers around the country uh, ever conducted anywhere in the world other outside of my own research and, and research of a few others done at universities but the first practicing field interpretive application of thought lifting ever in the world and it's quite, it's quite gratifying to see I'm going to end with a story how am I doing for time Anders? I think you have five minutes okay good Oh, well, then I'm just about out. I started late, though. You went over. Seven. I was on an airplane in, in Australia a few years ago, and I'm, I'm on my way from one event to another event, and I pick up the, the Qantas flight magazine, and there's an ad for a financial newspaper called the Financial Times. It's, it's the Australian and British, I think, in, in Britain you also have Financial Times, I believe. Um, uh, it's kind of like the Wall Street Journal. And, uh, and, and it showed this ad, which I thought was brilliant. At the top it says, talk provoking and it features these people they're all sitting around the table and they've all read the same issue of the paper now you know how people read newspapers you don't read it from page one to the end do you you bounce around and you look at headlines to see what interests you and so but nobody reads the whole paper if I was to walk in right now to this group and give them a test of the facts over the whole newspaper they would all fail wouldn't they they would all do poorly. And yet here they are. Every one of them was provoked by something they read. To, to, so much so that they now want to tell another person about it. And I thought, what a brilliant idea that represents about 35 years of professional work. It actually made me a little angry, Eva, because this artist figured it out. <laughs> and it took me so much longer. And I always wondered... What if instead of reading a newspaper, they had been on your nature tour? Right? They had been in your interpretive program or your naturum and read your exhibit. Or What would be the thoughts that they now would be provoked to tell another person about? When I envision the end game of interpretation, when I start developing a new interpretive product, whether it's a presentation or a panel or exhibit or brochure or website, it helps me to see this conversation with my audience in my mind's eye ahead of time and wonder what might be those thoughts. Because that's the end game of interpretation, not according to this one professor's formulation, but according to a vast body of research evidence. If you want to make a difference on purpose, get your audiences to make their own meaning. And that's the end game. And that will conclude it. I'd be happy to take your questions. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.